as a presidential candidate, Obama promised $150 billion for over 10 years on green energy technology and infrastructure. And this is what I mean about Democrats. I mean, that sounded like a lot. But that was less than the United States was spending in one year of the Iraq War. So I want to add a footnote here that even if Donald Trump reduces the money the federal government spends, which I said was pocket change, $39 billion a year, even if he reduces it to zero, and I'm saying this for the sake of being practical and, and hopeful, it's actually the states in our country, cities, institutions, and even market forces at this point, because it's cost effective, are driving renewables. It is not the federal government. Uh, we've had this, this sort of meager buffet of energy invested in, coal recently taken out, but oil, natural gas replacing coal, some renewables, some nuclear. So it is really at the local level, which I mean people have spoken to here about that there are places to work that are that are hopeful. And I'll just give you an example that um, New York, California, and recently Massachusetts last summer with their omnibus energy bill, together we comprise one fifth of the country, together the fourth largest economy in the world. And these three states have set the trend for the rest of the country. The goals by 2030 are what they should be. It is 50% renewables, the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions by about the same. This is very hopeful to me. Uh, if we just have more large states following, but also cities, institutions like UMass, divesting, and, and many others, but also in this case, the market is not going to listen to the, the uh, administration has come in because it's doing too well uh, with respect to renewables. So um, just uh, to wrap up the climate costs of militarism, uh, it, it, it has been analyzed that, that, I said it's the largest institutional contributor in the world. Keep in mind it has only 2 million people in it, but it contributes 5% of the global warming emissions. But they're understated. We are, our Air Force is the largest user of jet fuel in the world. Jet fuel is about three times as powerful a, a greenhouse gas emit, emitter as, as the rest of the equipment in which we use oil. The, another aspect uh, to, to keep in mind is this 5% does not include the emissions from all the civilian defense contractors who make the weapons for the war. That's another. Second, it does not include military aid. Think of the billions we give to Israel, to Egypt, to Saudi Arabia. They then use that money and it's intended to, to buy weapons from us. And so it's the, you know, the sort of underside of the military is the weapons manufacturers contributing. Another aspect that Michael Clare at Hampshire College, security analyst, has pointed out, he said everybody in this country and, and the rest of the world, industrial world, are fearful of terrorism, as if that is our greatest national security threat. He said behind the scenes, and most people don't know this, the generals and the defense industries are, and NATO and the US are talking about a third world war with the other great superpowers, Russia and, and China. And he said this is very real talk. And then he does point out that pushing NATO to the boundaries of Russia is fueling uh, Russia's militarization, our pivot to Asia, and make it, drawing a tight ring around China and its coast is also fueling China's rise in militarizing itself. So as we go, they go. And so if we are 37% of global military spending throughout the world, and we are 5%, I would say more like 8, 10% of global climate change. The rest, the other almost two thirds of global military spending is also contributing to climate change. So I would just draw a line under that and say it's 15 to 20% of climate emissions, and I never see them counted. Um, but that that's, that's driving climate change. So I'll finish by drawing from, it's a sort of characterization of our country and also of war by a military historian, Victor Hansen. He says first, war mirrors the culture of a country. And then he characterizes our culture. Manifest destiny, frontier mentality, 
rugged individualism and what he calls a muscular independence and it reminded me of the words that the Pentagon always uses which is projection of power or power projection in the world and uh, last unfettered market capitalism now this is a very familiar profile of the United States from the government level in history isn't it it's also I found interesting it reminded me sort of on a psychological level of Donald Trump also you think muscular independence rugged individualism, a manifest destiny of getting to be elected president of the United States, and unfettered market capitalism. But given that, one window into our culture, let us remember the plenitude of activist movements in our society that have profoundly changed this dominant cultural profile. And you named so many of them, and I will reiterate, and as, as did you, Priya. The feminist, civil rights, immigrant, and indigenous rights movement, the anti-war and peace movements, Black Lives Matter, climate justice movements, standing uh, rock water protectors, some are old movements, some are recent movements, progressive media, peace and justice studies, progressive labor and health workers, the co-op, sustainable agriculture, and transition town movements. And I want to say that today, we are witnessing the greatest confluence of activism since the 1960s. This is really hopeful. I'll just add that when I taught at Boston University School of Public Health, I remember about 12 years ago, uh, some of the students stayed after class, and, and these were uh, masters in public health students, and I don't know, perhaps we were talking about vegetarianism or something else, and I started describing to them the social movements of the 60s and just this immense uh, synergy that came through. You're a feminist, the women's movement, but you're against the Vietnam War, and you also want to be part of civil rights, uh, et cetera. And, and then the, you know, the sort of cruelty to animals uh, type of movement came along, and they looked at me and said, you were so lucky. Having been their age with this powerful tsunami of social activism, well, I see it today. I think I mean, we all see you feel it. Uh, so our challenge as old and young activists is to build voice, social cohesion among our movements. We are larger, of course, united, and public influence for our share, shared values to get that out into the public consciousness. So we have two golden rules to live by, not just one. The first we're familiar with, love thy neighbor. And I think of Joanna Macy's you know, inspiring words that you gave. It's understood as thyself. It can be very hard to do. <laughs> and this you know, is it's, it's, it's a legacy of religions and philosophies across the millennia. The second golden rule, love thy nature as thyself. <laughs> and this, of course, is millennia of indigenous consciousness. And I propose a new Hippocratic oath to pledge, which is do no further harm. These encompass the two great defining issues of our times, climate change and militarism. And so we must work together, not in silos. And I particularly say this to the climate change movement, to reverse these and promote enduring peace on Earth and peace with Earth. So thank you.